So the, the first lecturer is Simone Marzani from the, the University of Genova in, in Italy. He's a great expert in QCD and in general collider physics. He has been in Genova for a few years now, right, Simone? Four years, I guess. Yeah, so for, for four years. And uh, 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 we are pleased to have him this, uh, this year as, as lecturer. And he will uh, try to present to you topics about QCD and collider physics, so, uh, an overview of this uh, subject with also some insight, of course. I repeat again, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand or write it on the chat and we will uh, give you the possibility to uh, speak with the speaker. And of course, uh, remember that if you have more detailed questions or longer one, you can ask them more properly in the uh, discussion session every evening. Okay, so instead of having long discussions during the lessons, it is better to postpone long or complex questions to the evening in such a way that we can have a longer and more detailed chat with the speakers. Okay, Simone, thank you again, and please start with your lecture. Okay, thank you very much, Giuliano. Uh, well, I would like to thank the organizer for, uh, organizer for inviting me, and um, I share the regret of not being in Florence. I was looking forward to... The visit and to be honest i was looking forward to a school with uh, a little more of interactions with, with students uh, not with the computer screen so uh, i guess i'll try my best to uh, uh, engage you all with the, uh, with the with these lectures and yes please if you have questions and uh, uh, they're short write them on the chat uh, and if not we'll are really looking forward to discussions uh, later this afternoon Okay, so um, what is my plan? Um, okay, my, my plan is to have like five lectures uh, touching on uh, uh, topics which I think are interesting uh, in, uh, uh, in the broader theme of collider phenomenology and, and QCD. Of course, the review I'm going to give is a bit biased towards what are my expertise and what are the things I like. Uh, and so, um, I guess this is part of a, of a school. Uh, so we're going to have five lectures um, touching. The first one will be more of a, of a chat uh, about collider uh, phenomenology and sort of give you basics information and, and motivation uh, for studying high energy interaction with colliders. Then in the second lecture, I will try to talk a little bit about QCD and uh, Assuming that you all have a sort of like basic knowledge of uh, quantum field theory and, and realization, and if not, we can discuss this more in the, uh, in the afternoon. And, and I will try to always, you know, do examples. Keep an, you know, discuss one example, which is a very important process in collider phenomenology, which is called the Brennan process. So we discuss it in the first lecture, in the second lecture, and also in the, the following ones. And then in lecture three, I will go to a more uh, advanced topic, which is the topic of resummation, which is something I um, uh, really, really like. And then the final two lectures are, if you want a little bit more focused on what, what are my research interests, in, interest, which I also think are important uh, for collaborative knowledge. And we will talk about jet physics and jet substructure. Um, I thought a lot about how to actually deliver these lectures. And at the end of the day, I decided to um, talk about many things uh, and with the caveat that most of the times I'm not going to be able to go into the details of the calculations. So I'm not going to uh, spend, I'm, I'm not going to do all the calculations in detail here on the blackboard or on, on the iPad. Uh, I really encourage you to try to do so. Um, and so here and there I'll have some like problems. Some of them are quick, some of them are not that quick uh, to, to go through. But it's a, it's a way, like, you know, try and actually do the calculations. It's, it's the way you actually understand what we're talking about. Uh, if I had to do all the calculations, then I would need, like, a month. Uh, and so in order to, you know, be able to sketch uh, many, uh, many ideas, I, let, I decided not to go into the details. Uh, but I'm happy to try and, uh, and, and, and answer questions if you have doubts about it. Okay. Um, 
a word about uh, bibliography. Um, so I guess you know the course is really about two different parts. Um, uh, well, two different areas. Let's say they're, they're not separated. Not separated into parts. But uh, really, we're going to talk about concepts in uh, uh, quantum field theory or in general quantum mechanics. And for those, I really like uh, you know recommend any any good book on quantum field theory. For me, like the, the ones I've been using more, more most recently for uh, lectures are uh, the nice book by Matt Schwartz and also the classics by Kaskin um, and Schoen. Um, a lot of these lecture courses are taken, uh, they, they deal with phenomenology. And so there are uh, nice books on um, phenomenology as well. Uh, so for instance, I took quite a lot of inspiration from the first part of, of this book, which is called The Black Book of QCD by John Campbell, um, Joe Houston and Frank Krauss. Uh, and actually the idea of like picking one process and, and discuss it, like different aspects of it came from this book. Uh, the process is very similar, it's not identical to one thing. Then there's a classics for uh, QCD and Collider Physics, which is the pink book by Alice Sterling and Ned Weber. And okay, then uh, the, la the final two lectures are instead mostly based on a, on a book I wrote together with uh, Michael Spanowski, which is not spelled like that. So. Uh, and uh, Gregory Swaggy, uh, which is called Looking and Suggest, you can also find in the archive. Um, there are other books which are uh, very nice about QCD and collider physics, especially about QCD, but because we're not going to, uh, the, the focus of the lecture is more about, is more on collider physics and not so much on the foundation of QCD. I didn't use them that much in these lectures, but these are uh, real resources which I, if you're interested in the subject or you're doing a PhD which involves QCD, uh, you know, I really encourage you to, to read those books. One is a, a book by Collins, which is called Foundations of QCD, or Perturbative QCD. And the other one, um, it's, a, it's a classics, uh, which from the Russian school, um, which is called Basics of Perturbative QCD. Not so basic, but it's called Basics of Perturbative QCD. Okay. Um, I guess we, we can now start. Um, I'll try to do, say, like uh, you know, 50 minutes and then we can take a break and then continue. Okay, so the lecture courses are called Collider Physics, uh, Collider Phenomenology. Uh, and so the first question we, uh, we would like to answer is why, why do we collide particles? And um, well, the answer is um, it's pretty basics. And it's, if you want, it's the same thing that we do. You know, when you enter uh, a dark room, you know, you don't see what's what's in the room, and you want to find your way. So, so you start like touching things. And and if you uh, if you want, that's what we want to do when we do collider physics. Right? We don't want to understand uh, fundamental physics. We want to understand. The, the building blocks of nature and how they interact. And so the best way we can do these is to try to look inside. And how do we look inside them? Well, one way is to uh, take particles that we can find in nature, electrons, positrons, let's say we can find in nature, or protons, and, and collide them together at very high edge. Uh, why do we do so? Well, you know, what we have in mind is always uh, Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. Because if you can collide particles with AI energy, it's very naive uh, or very simple, we can, we have a lot of energy at our disposal. And we, a lot of energy, we can do essentially three things. We can produce heavy objects. I'd like to be able to write today. Heavy objects that don't exist in nature, well, don't, don't exist in nature in a stable way. So for instance, we would like to produce the Higgs boson. Um, on the other hand, high energy, uh, if you think about Compton, Compton wavelength, means very uh, short wavelength. So we would like to understand short distance physics.
And another reason we do so, we do controlled collider experiments, is because we want to study very rare processes. As we shall see shortly, you know, most of the time we collide to protons are very high energy, nothing really interesting happens. And so we have to collide a lot of protons, very many of them, to try and understand, to try to see something interesting, to see, for instance, the production of the Higgs boson, and, uh, and uh, so that we can study its properties. Okay, so that's why we, we do collider experiments. So we, you know, we collide bunches of particles, many particles in a controlled way at very high energy. These are you know, the three things on this high energy. Of course, the next question is like, what, what particles do you want to collide? Okay, I mentioned electrons. These are very easy to find in nature. It's not so difficult to also uh, produce positrons or antielectrons. And of course, we can provide, provide protons or antiprotons. So we have, you know, we can make choices. And so the second question we would like to ask, we're asking ourselves is colliding what? And here I sometimes like to draw a picture, which is a kind of a winding road. Okay, I never was was never very good at drawing things. That's cool. And and this road, you know, represents like the sort of like the history of high energy particle physics. And you can, like, along this road, go back to the 1980s. And um, at that point, um, you know, the flagship experiment uh, for particle physics was called the SPS at CERN. This operated from 1981 to 84. I guess for you is, uh, you know, ancient history. I, I was born in that. Um, A few years later, also another experiment at CERN was called LEP. Okay, and this was uh, a collider which was acting uh, active until the uh, early 2000. I think it was 19. Well, I wrote 1981 on my, uh, my it's probably 1991. Let me double check this. Or maybe it was 81. Let's double check this later. Um, if you go a few years up, later than that, also in America, in the United States, was, was built a big collider, which was called the Tevatron. This was built at Fermila near Chicago. This also started its operation in the mid 80s up until 2011. Um, other type of colliders, for instance, very interesting for QCD was the Hera Collider, the Daisy Nambuk. Um, this was active in, say, in the 90s. Um, and then here we can also put the so-called BFAC, the spell, a keck of our slack. These was were active 1990s to early 2000s, 2010s. And then finally, I guess this is our H collider, the LSC itself. It starts its operation in 2000. Well, there was an accident. Okay, you see that I I wrote them in two separate like two separate sides of this road and two separate colors. And the reason I've done that is that essentially the the different colors represent the type of particles that were chosen uh, to collide. SPS at CERN collided uh, uh, protons, and the um, highlight 
of these experiments was the discovery of the W and the Z electroweak dose, which confirmed the fact that the, uh, the, the picture of electroweak interaction we had was actually correct. The Tevatron and Fermi lab did many studies, many, uh, because I'm, I'm only just saying one, you know, the, what I think is the highlight, of course, these experiments have many, many more results. Uh, the Tevatron, the highlight, I guess, for the Tevatron was the discovery of the heaviest particles we know, and the heaviest fundamental particles we know, which is a top book. And of course, the highlight so far um, for the CERN LEC has been a discovery of the Higgs boson. So these were P, PP, or PP bar collisions. Uh, the Tevatron was a proton anti proton smasher. On the other hand, on this side of the, of the, of the road, we have E plus E minus collisions, where error was really an electron proton collision. And uh, I guess one can ask is what, what were the highlights of these, uh, of these colliders? Were there discoveries? And I would argue that these colliders, the highlights of these colliders were not discovery, but rather precision test. For instance, the studies that lab did uh, um, running E plus E minus collision at the Z pole allow us to actually uh, establish the standard model as the theory of fundamental interactions. And so for me, the highlight of lab has been precision test of the standard model. And especially it's like electroweak part. Um, the highlight of the uh, Hera collider, so Zeus and H1 experiments, for me, has been the studies that they be able to perform and are still performing about QCD. So this is precision QCD, and we'll see later in the lecture course to, to date the data that have been collected by the Hera experiments form the backbone of uh, the from like the backbone of, all, of the data that we use to determine what are called pattern distribution functions. We'll, we'll say more about this in the lectures, but still these experiments performed in the 90s and early 2000s, the data from the experiments are really uh, one of the most important pieces of information that we need to understand pattern distribution functions. So the, the structure of protons at high energy. So very important for this type of studies. And Bell and Babar, these are called the B factories because they were um, colliders built to study uh, the B work and allow us to reach a very precise understanding of uh, flavor physics. So you see the pattern which is emerging. Um, if you want to do precision physics, then historically, and there's a reason for that, we will, you know, what we what we wanted to do was to smash together electrons and protons and positrons, or electrons and protons in the case of uh, in the case of, of, of air. While if you want to reach discovery, if you want to achieve discovery, then historically it's always been the case that you have to you have to smash protons or protons and antiprotons. It was the case for W and Z um, this discovery of the W and Z boson, top quark and the X, and maybe it will be for, for new physics uh, at the LHC. Um, why, why is the case? Well, uh, as, we, as we shall see for in the rest of the course, um, QCD, which is the theory that describes star interactions, is uh, it's a messy theory. Um, and that is true on the theoretical side, but actually we like to say in general, the strong interactions are rather messy. Strong interactions, as the name suggests, are strong, and so they cause a lot of radiation. Um, so if you want to do precision studies, then it's better to limit as much as possible strong interaction um, to the point where you, want, you don't want to lose uh, per section. And so if you smash electrons and positrons, uh, you achieve what we refer to as a clean environment. 
because electron protons are not strongly tightened particles, so all the QCD finals, all the QCD interactions are limited to the final state. And so we have, a, you know, we control back the initial state, we have collisions where um, we control the kinematics better and, and we actually uh, uh, model them better. However, the price that we pay is that typically, well, electron and protons are fairly light, uh, uh, sorry, electron and positrons are fairly light compared to the proton. And so if we build circular colliders, we, I'm sure you've seen, you've heard these in your uh, elementary particle uh, introductory lecture courses, uh, you lose energy uh, because of uh, singleton radiation, because these particles move in circles, and, and this energy loss is very damaging for electrons which are light, and it's less damaging there if, if you accelerate um, heavier particles. So I guess this is the reason for, for which, at, you know, given a certain technology, you know, a certain point in our technology development history, then with protons, you can build circular colliders that with the same magnet um, essentially can, uh, can give you uh, high energy in the collision central mass. And this is one of the reasons for which like, people are talking about, have been talking about for many, many years now to build a linear plus and minus colliders. Uh, we don't know whether this is going to happen actually, but uh, that's, uh, that's the reason. If you build something linear, then you don't lose uh, radiation. You don't have synchrotron radiation, so you lose less energy. However, what is the, part, the, the price you pay if you collide protons? Well, you have now strong interaction in the initial state and the final state. And on top of that, uh, protons, uh, we know now, are not elementary particles. And so really, like, you have to work a little bit harder if you want to understand what's going on uh, in, at the core of the collision because you're not colliding elementary building blocks like electrons and protons, but protons are themselves, they have some dynamics. And so you, you really need to uh, get your hands dirty and, and understand this a little bit better. Okay, and so, you know, we have this, always this tension. If you want to do discovery, then we want to have the maximum possible energy given our technology, and so we would like to collide protons. On the other hand, if you want to do precision physics, um, and then E plus E minus colliders are better. Now, uh, this, was a, this has been a big challenge for the theory community and for the experimental community working on the LHC. So can we try, can we make the LHC, which is a proton-proton collider, into not only a discovery machine, but also into a precision machine? And, and I think the, now the answer is yes, uh, we can do that. Of course, not, uh, not always at the level of E plus E minus colliders, but thanks to the tremendous um, uh, improvements in theory calculation, understanding of QCD on the one hand, and on the other hand, thanks to the uh, incredible experimental developments, which I'll try to share with you, although I'm a theorist, so I don't have, I don't have the knowledge, the knowledge of experiments, but try to give you a feeling that, you know, we, we, have, we now have both uh, experimental and theoretical tools to perform uh, precision physics also at the edge. And this is a necessity because we in, indeed we did discover the exposure, but we discovered nothing else. So um, we we really need to uh, 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 reach precision uh, precision if you want to exploit uh, the physics potential of the LHC. Okay, okay. Today's first part of this lecture, was, there's a lot of talking. Then uh, I'll try to be a bit more precise later on. Okay, so what is the game we play? And I think here it is, uh, I find interesting sort of way to try and sketch um, how you can see the very same uh, thing, like a high, uh, high energy collision in, uh, with different point of view. So, if I look, you know, if I look at a high energy collision and the theories, so if you if you study uh, in your in your lecture courses um, high energy collisions from in, in a QFT course, for instance, then I guess the way you think about a collision is that one: well, I want to um, you know, write down my Lagrangian, and with the Lagrangian, I can construct what I can see what are the possible interaction in theory, and I you know I'm, if I'm lucky enough that the theory is perturbative, I can use perturbation theory to evaluate uh, transition amplitudes and then cross-section. And 
I guess the universal way we, we know is not the only way, but the way we think about perturbation theory in QFT is through primary paradoxes. And so, for instance, if you if you think about a, a collision, for instance, the production of a, of a Higgs boson, uh, a theorist will say, well, what is the production of the Higgs boson? Well, I need gluons um, to form some sort of final diagrams and to produce a Higgs in the final state. Okay, and maybe okay if I'm like if I work hard enough, I can also attach to these the decay product of the Higgs, for instance. Two photons. This is the way the, uh, the, the Higgs was discovered. It's decay into two photons. And maybe, I don't know, like you can also have some, some other like QCD activity. A phenomenologist instead will say, well, okay, um, that's what happens. On your piece of paper, really, what happens if I, I don't know, if I run a an event generator, a computer program that simulates uh, collision, uh, a particle collides? Well, I'll have my well. First of all, I won't have my gluons coming in, but I'll have my protons coming in, and the protons will do something. They'll interact, and what are the um, what are the, the outcome, the decay, the, the products of this interaction? Well, for sure, I, you know, I'm producing a Higgs, but I'm not going to see a Higgs in the final state. What I'm going to see instead are the, uh, the two photons somewhere in uh, my calorimeter. And the Higgs won't be produced by itself, but it will recoil against some stuff. And try to characterize you know, the the structure of the decay products and of the stuff that the Higgs is recoiling against is one of the uh, most important job that uh, phenomenology does. But really, like then, you know, and you think about, you know, sometimes uh, you know, I call myself phenomenologist, so I, you know, that's, that's the way sometimes I think about collisions. But then I talk to my experimental colleagues and they tell me what actually happens. And what actually happens is that we don't, you know, for sure we don't collide gluons, but we don't even collide two protons. Really what we collide is bunches of 10 to 11 protons. Okay, that's a big number. So you don't have one proton and one proton, but you have a bunch of 10 to 11 protons. That's 100 billion protons. And I collide them. Now you can ask, uh, what rate do I collide them in at the LHC? And the answer is that the collision rate is 40 megahertz. So 40 million times uh, per second, I uh, bunches of 10 to 11 protons interact at the interaction point of the LHC. So clearly you see that already, um, there's a big difference in the way you know, we treat, we see these problems from the experimental viewpoint, from a theorist viewpoint. And the job of the phenomenologist is try really to bridge this gap. He's try to you know, uh, understand how we can, whether we can, and if so, how we can use the language of quantum field theory to describe these billions or, and billions of interactions. Um, just to give you an idea, like uh, crank some numbers uh, uh, and some terminology from the sort of like real world collider physics. Uh, if you look at some presentation by experimentalists that uh, are on colliders, uh, sometimes you talk about, uh, they talk about what is the instantaneous, they talk about the word luminosity, right? And they talk about this word in two different, uh, meaning two different things. One is this instantaneous luminosity. And this is defined as the number of like uh, protons in the two bunches times the frequency of interaction divided some 
by some effective areas, which essentially tells you sort of like the areas of the, the, the cross section, but well, the colliding effective area of information. Now, if you put there the, the numbers, um, and one and two is uh, 10 to 11, 10 to 11, that's 10 to the 22. 40 billion megahertz, that's four times 10 to seven hertz. And then this effective area, well, usually is taken as 10 to the minus two centimeters, 10 to the minus four centimeters. And it gives you a rough estimate of this of the luminosity, which usually is written in terms of uh, you see the, the, the units are centimeters to the minus two, second to minus one. And that's roughly, if you put in the numbers, you get 10 to the 33 centimeters minus two. And indeed, actually the peak luminosity, if I correctly looked it up, that is being reached at the LHC is actually larger than this. Is Two times 10 to the 34. And very often, experimentalists also talked about the integrated luminosity. And that's nothing more than the, the integral of the luminosity over some, over some time. And this tells you the amount of data that had been collected or recorded by. Um, very often, in as you probably know, in collider physics, we use a, um, a different units of measure for cross sections uh, or uh, areas, which is the, the bar. Once in the square is 10 to the 24. So, in these units, the proton proton collision is roughly 0 0.1. Okay, um, what, why I'm saying all of this? I, I guess what I want to know is I want to have a, a rough estimate of how many. So if I if I collide with this uh, 40 megahertz frequency, 10 to 11 bunches of protons, how many interaction do I? How many proton-proton interaction do I actually have? And if I have the, the proton-proton cross section, uh, an estimate for this, which is roughly 0.1 uh, bun. And I have the, the luminosity of the LHC, which is roughly 10 to the 34 um, centimeters minus two, second minus one. Then I can uh, work out that I have roughly a billion PP collision per second. Or if you want, 10 to the 9 divided 40 megahertz is roughly 25 pp collision per bunch crossing. So why I'm saying all these numbers, but do we have to remember them? It's good to keep in mind like the order of magnitude, but the point I'm making is that it's it's tremendously tremendously difficult um, to uh, first of all to uh, get out of this gigantic amount of data something interesting. Also, it would be impossible to store all of this information, and so experimentalists guided by uh, phenomenologists and, and, and physical understanding, they need to make, make choices. They need to discard the vast majority of events because this will lead to nothing interesting. We're well, not interested from the point of view of our energy physics. And uh, we can't afford to store all this data, so we have to put in what technically are called triggers to so select data that they look interesting so that we can keep them and then look at them later in more details. Uh, it gives you an idea of another challenge that we'll discuss towards the second part of the lecture process. 25 collisions per bunch crossing. It means 
And this gives you an idea of what I mean by saying that proton-proton collisions are messy. You know, you don't have one proton coming into one proton producing another interaction, but you have many of them all at the same time in your detector producing something. Some of the interaction will be hard, most of them will be soft, but you need to find a way to disentangle. This is usually referred to as the pie-like uh, problem. Okay, so we have many, many proton-proton collisions, and as we said, some of them are uh, soft, they're not very interesting. Other, they actually contain the physics we want to study. So they produce the physics they want to study. So they produce Higgs boson, they produce a Z boson, a W, top four. Um, I think what is interesting to get some idea is to build what experimentally, sometimes they refer to as the stairway plot. And you can find them, you know, a precise, now I'm going to sketch one, but you can find uh, a precise one on uh, the Atlas public results web page of the CMS public. Um, what are these plots show? Well, let's imagine we, we write down uh, a scale for cross sections. Okay, so a useful scale for collider cross sections is the pico bar. Okay, um, so let's build a log scale. So we have twelve to the twelve pico bar. That's one bar. One. Then we have 10 to 11, 10 to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four, three. One, it's five, four, three. Two, one, zero. And then you can go also the smallest case. Okay, we argue that the proton proton total cross section or the inelastic proton cross section is here. This is a log scale, right? So let me also do nine, six, seven, eight. Now we can ask on this scale, where are the interesting, uh, the process we are interested in? So we learn that a, an interesting way of characterizing QCD final state is through the concept of jets. We'll discuss them. Um, uh, later in the in the lecture process. Now, so if you if you're interested in QCD correction, uh, QCD cross sections with the final state that can be computed in perturbation theory, you usually talk about jets. And how big is the jet cross section? Well, it really depends on the jet definition and most importantly on the the transfer momentum, the energy of the jet you're looking at. But let's say you know they they span a vast uh, region in in cross section, but more or less they are something between ten to the nine and uh, um, 10 to the 6. This depends on PT, gel definition, so on and so forth. And so, in sort of like in the, on this plot, they're actually not so difficult to see. Okay, the, the cross section is relatively large. It's very small compared to the total proton proton corrections, but they're still like, you know, sizable and not too difficult to see. Now we want to ask some more detailed questions. Like let's say we want to study electroweak physics. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the interesting thing we want to do. What is the cross section to uh, produce, uh, which we produce W and Z and photons uh, at the LHC? Well, it's more around this, this region here, 10 to the three, 10 to the four. So here we can produce Z, WZ, 
and gametes. Uh, a bit smaller than that here, roughly, is the TT bar cross section production of, uh, of pork uh, of top and anti top. The X cross section, and be careful, this is the total rate, then you have to decay. Is more or less here. And roughly the same order of magnitude, you, you also have the cross section to produce two Ws, two Zs, and etc. Et These are important if you want to test um, uh, uh, models beyond the sun. And, uh, and you can go deeper and deeper in this plot. For instance, here at the very bottom, well, at the very bottom of the things I've written. Uh, you can find the cross section to produce the Z boson plus six jets. So a Z boson has a lot of QCD activity. Or you can even produce three vector bosons. Of course, you know, the more you go deep, uh, the deeper you go in this plot, the more difficult things become. Why? Well, because you need these processes are rare, become rarer and rarer. So you need to um, try and dig them out from a background that can be overwhelmed. And so this is a challenge. Um, not so much, it's a challenge, both of the experiments, because they need to find a way to extract tiny signals from each background, but also the challenge from the theory community, because we need to be able to compute these perceptions at the precision level, and we need to compute the backgrounds to this process at the precision level, so that we can actually distinguish them. And all of these processes that are you know, background to one another, because if you want to compute the TT bar cross section, then you'll have a background. But then let's say you want to do something different, then TT bar can become your background. That's the price you pay for the fact that with proton proton collision in general, with particle collision, we have huge ranging cross sections. And more interesting, you have many different final states. And that's the crucial difference that we have for, in particle phase. In, Collider physics compared to other experiments. We, we're not, we don't build the LEC to look for one process, but we have hundreds of different processes that we want, we can study. That's a good thing, that's an exciting thing, but also it's something that um, we need to deal with. Okay, so let me finish this introductory discussion um, with the uh, uh, sort of try to. Uh, list the, the three questions, well, list three interesting questions that we'll try uh, and answer during the course of the lectures. So this is a very personal statement. What are the, what are three interesting questions for phenomenology? Question number one, and can we model all of this? I mean, these are proton-proton collisions uh, with cross-section um, the spans like, I don't know, 12, 15 or the magnitudes. And protons are no elementary particles. Things are produced like the Higgs, the Z, things decay. Do we have a model for all this? Um, if we do, um, can we, we can compute cross sections. And we can compute cross section. What is the accuracy? I mean, can we compute the X cross section with the you know estimated uncertainty of I don't know fifty percent, ten percent, two percent? What is important? What is the goal that we should have in mind? Clearly, this depends on the process. But once you have a target, can you achieve this precision target with current technology? And uh, finally, can we design strategies to separate these different processes?
let me call it signal from background, but it should be clear that signal and background are, you know, can be different things for different persons. And now, let me add like a, 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 a two caveats on this third point. This strategy should be theoretically sound. So that we can apply the model developed in point one and point two, but also experimentally measure, measurable. So these will be these are going to be the two pillars, um, or rather than pillars, the two checks that we have to do every time we come up something new. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I, I want to define a final state in any way so that I can distinguish this final state I'm interested in from the background. Can I do that from a theoretical point of view? Meaning, if I try to compute the cross-section for this process, do I get a sensible number or do I get infinity? And we'll see that there are plenty of ways um, that you can do to get infinity. And infinity is often, very often, not a good answer for a cross-section. But on the other hand, we don't only live in theory land, what we want to do is to build things uh, or come up with ideas that can be used in actual experimental analysis. Okay, so this is the, you know, the, the double point of view that we need to take as for now. Okay. Any question so far? I don't see any. Okay, so before the break, uh, there's one more thing I want to discuss, and this will be very, um, a very fast and very brief introduction. Uh, I just want to uh, say a couple of things that I'm going to use later on about the sort of like basic scattering theory that always underpins all our research, and and so um, I'm going to say a couple of words about the, what is called the S matrix of the scattering matrix. Now, this will be really a couple of words because uh, you have uh, uh, lectures, uh, right, starting this afternoon, uh, an entire lecture course uh, dedicated to the S matrix. And I'm sure Sasha you know, will tell you many more things that are uh, interesting. Things. I really need um, a couple of points about the S matrix. What is the S matrix? Well, it's an operator that maps uh, in, in our, in our you know, theoretical view of the scattering. Uh, you have an initial state, uh, quantum mechanic initial state, you have a quantum mechanic final state, and you want to understand like, the, uh, the, the, the transition probability or the, the amplitude that uh, you get if you superimpose this. And the scattering matrix, there are like precise way of defining but it's the, this operator that maps the initial state, which lives uh, in uh, uh, T minus infinity uh, onto the, to, to the final state that is at T plus infinity. And I'm not gonna, uh, there will be many things one could say about the S matrix, and I'm sure you will discuss this later, so I'm gonna, not gonna say uh, much more than that. Um, okay, so if I start with the initial state A, and I want to, go into, want to measure the final state B, then I'm gonna, talk about S, S matrix elements and the matrix element defined like that. Um, as I said, like what I need are the basic properties of the S matrix. And property number one is that the S matrix is unitary. And that's related to the conservation of, of probability. That means that if I take initial state A, S into final state N, and I take the square model, so from an amplitude I go to a cross section, and I sum over all possible final state, then I should be getting one. Okay, but let me write this in a, in a slightly different form, that's the sum over n a 
S dagger N N plus A. But if these are all the possible states, that's a complete basis. And so I get. And this should be valid, all initial state, which means indeed that the S matrix should be a unity of curvature. Um, rather than just metrics in, in scattering theory, one always consider um, these to like what is called the T matrix. So we separate off the identity from the S matrix. So we separate off it. nothing happens from something does happen. And you know, this I is conventional uh, for, uh, things that you'll see in a second. Now, what are, what are the consequences of the unitary, unitary uh, Utilitarity of f of s on t, one we should have the one s s dagger, so that identity minus i t dagger times identity plus i t. That should be the identity s dagger s of one, which means that minus i t dagger minus if I um, so if I you know, expand this product I get the identity which cancel with identity on the other uh, side and then I get uh, plus I T dagger equals And then I have minus t, t. I guess, hopefully I get all the sign. And I wrote it like that. Okay, so what's hap what happens to this equation if I consider matrix elements? So let me call t a b a matrix element. Sorry, TB. TBA is defined as the matrix element between state A and B. And then TB, T dagger A is I call it TAB star. Now, if I evaluate these, uh, these, this relation on, onto the states, then I get minus i t a t b a minus t a b star equals sum over n t b n t n star. And I'm interested at this relation when I look, when I take the state A to be equal to state B. And then I get the uh, TAA minus T star AA, that's um, uh, twice the imaginary part. is equal to the sum over n okay so taa minus t star a that's a comp so it's a difference between the complex number is complex conjugate that gives you uh, twice i times the imaginary part but then i have an overall minus i which comes in yeah and that it's what you usually prefer as to the optical view. Which tells us that there is a relation between the forward scattering amplitude, TAA, what is it called the forward scattering amplitude? Because it is a scattering amplitude which has the same initial state into the final state, and the total cross section, the amplitude square for 
going from A to any possible point. Pictorially, this is sometimes represented like that. So I have TAA, what is TAA? Well, I start from A and I end up in A, but anything can happen in between. And I take the imaginary part of this guy. And this is the sum over n. And now I want to go from a to n in all possible way, which I sometimes OK, um, we're going to use this uh, later on, but I'm not going to dig into any more details of uh, S as matrix theory. Uh, but I can give you here an exercise, something you can try if you want, to you know, familiarize yourself with this notation. You can consider, for simplicity, a, a, a theory with uh, two scalar fields. So you write a Lagrangian with a scalar field phi and a scalar field pi. I the scalar field phi as mass m square and the scalar field pi, or capital M square, and the other one uh, is little m square. These are real scalar fields. And they're coupled with this type of interaction. OK, so the exercise is the following. So you can compute uh, the decay rate gamma uh, for phi decaying to pi pi. At order at first a first non-trivial order that will be order lambda square. And you can do this in the standard way. Uh, what is the standard way? You draw the Feynman diagram, there's only one Feynman diagram that contributes to this. So this Feynman diagram, and you square it and you integrate over the final state of the of the phase space of the final state. Or B. Repeat the calculation. Using the optical theorem. So rather than computing uh, the decay of phi into uh, pi pi, these fine diagrams and the square it, you compute the forward amplitude And you only take the imaginary part. And this sometimes is written this way, meaning that you take a cut on the line. So you can do two things. You can compute a three-level diagram, square it, integrate over the phase space of the two final state. Or you can compute a loop diagram of a simple process and, and only consider the imaginary part of this loop diagram. And you should find the same answer. OK? OK, so okay. So now we're kind of ready to start by you know, looking at our first process. And the process we're going to keep looking at throughout the course of these lectures is called the Dryan-Yang process. What is the Dryland process? It's a process where I start, I collide two protons, proton one and proton two. This proton interacts, so something happens. And what I measure in the final state are two muons, or uh, a, a muon and antimuon, or electron and electron, it's the same, plus eventually other stuff. 
And what we would like to do is to compute this cross section as a function of the invariant mass of mu plus mu minus, which I call q squared. What is the invariant mass? I take the full momentum of the new and the full momentum of the anti muon I sum them and square them in Lorentz sense. So I get a Lorentz invariant, that's the invariant mass of the system. And how I want to do this calculation, but I would like to use perturbative theory. Simone, there is a question on the chat. Hey. Go on. Uh, let me see the chat. Uh, no, it's not square. Lambda is dimension uh, one. That, that was the question from Emmanuel. It's really like, uh, I, I'm not going to look at the like, right the correction of this. I also made up this, this Lagrangian just before. Thanks for the question. OK, I would like to use. Uh, uh, what we're going to say, compute this process using perturbation theory. And maybe the S matrix, maybe field theory, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's say I would like to use perturbative quantum field theory, just to be very specific. However, we really like find a problem. That, uh, I guess you all read in books and someone told you that protons are governed by non perturbative dynamics. And so we start like already scratching our heads because we would like to use so the S matrix formulas and maybe embed the S matrix formulas in perturbative quantum field theory. Uh, sorry, say in a better way. We would like to use perturbative theory to evaluate the S matrix elements. That's a better way of saying. But we already start, we already have the problem that the initial states uh, that we, uh, uh, we have to work with are governed by non perturbative interaction. And and so that's the first you know, puzzle that we have. How do we make sense of S matrix elements, which are non perturbative initial state? Actually, it gets even worse. Um, because if you really, uh, even if protons were perturbative, uh, we will we'll still have another problem. Um, in the theory, a problem also is shared by a, a simple theory of electricity, which is quantum electrodynamics. Um, in QED, you know, even if you collided uh, electrons and, and, and protons, um, you still face the issue of the fact that by doing the calculation, you'll find and see uh, singularities popping up. Now, if singularities are related to the ultraviolet normalization of the theory, we don't worry about that too much. But what we'll, we will see in QED and this one is that you also have singularities related to um, uh, low value of the quanta of the theory, so so-called infrared singularities. And these are related to the fact that the um, uh, QED and also QCD are mediated by uh, uh, gauge bosons, which are masses. And so even if you were able to uh, define the S matrix um, in a perturbative way, there will be a problem in trying to define the S matrix in the usual way, meaning that we'll have issues in defining states, uh, asymptotic states, which behave like free, free states. That's the usual construction that you do in QFT, right? You, you talk about in and out states which behave as free states. Now, um, that's a problem. Uh, it's, it's not trivial to do so, <laughs> actually, it's impossible to do so in, uh, in, uh, in gauge theories with massless bosons. Uh, and the, the way around this is that we're going to we're going to talk will be a very physical one. So we're going to talk about we're not going to talk about amplitude scattering amplitudes, but we're going to talk about cross sections. And crucial for us will be the fact that we're going to produce we're going to consider processes where we produce the final state we're interested in. In this case, we plus or minus plus anything else. So the way we're going to cure this. Um, infrared singularities that originate from the fact that asymptotic states in the S matrix sense are not very well defined in, uh, when you have uh, massless interactions, will be to 
give up talking about amplitudes. We'll talk about cross sections and more, more precisely, we'll talk about cross section with some level of inclusivity. So we're going to sum all the stuff that we don't do. And uh, thanks to this assumption, we'll be able to write down um, something which uh, is analogous to the pattern model uh, for deep analysis capital. So we will be able to separate, uh, uh, well, we'll be able to do two things. We'll be able to um, cancel this unwanted uh, infrared singularity. And if they cannot be canceled, then we can be able to, we will be able to factorize them in some uh, non preservative objects. Okay. So, what we're going to do in the second part of the lecture today will be sort of to state this pattern model, uh, uh, state the pattern model for proton-proton uh, -proton interactions, and, and try to justify a little bit more. I think uh, this is probably a good time to stop. So, second part of today lecture, I want to discuss a little bit um, how to set up um, uh, a possible way of calculating uh, the cross-section for this uh, gradient process in general, how to calculate uh, cross-section involving protons in the initial state. And all the discussion will be based on what is known as the Parton model. We'll, I will give you some historical details and justification of the Parton model in QCD tomorrow. So today we'll just take it as, as a model that we, we can use to compute cross sections. And the basic statement of the Parton model uh, is that if we interested at uh, high energy collisions, then the inelastic proton proton collision inelastic because you know we're going to destroy the protons and we're going to you know form different initial states uh, can be described in terms of the uh, of cross section of interactions between two uh, states which are called patterns and we're going to think about them as quarks uh, one for each proton and the idea is that these quarks they carry a frac. They move in the same direction as the proton, and they carry a fraction of, of, of the proton uh, for moment. So, the pictorially, the part of model that we're going to use, we have two protons with four momenta p1 and p2. Now I draw them in like like a Feynman diagram. But this is not really a Feynman diagram. So the two protons are coming, uh, they're colliding with each other. And really, the ING cross section that we're interested in here is going to be written in terms of cross section of partons, so you know, particles or quasi particles that are in the protons, which carry a fraction Z1 of the first proton, and Z2 of the other proton. And the outcome of this cross section, of this interaction, will be our two final state, you, the two particles that we're interested in the final state, which were labeled with momenta P3 and P4, plus eventually <coughs> other, other stuff. So in this, uh, let, me, let me introduce some notation. Capital S, it's not going to be the S matrix in this context, is the Mandelstam variant computed with the proton for momenta, and in this very high energy limit, the protons are considered to be massless. So this is 2p1 dot p2. Well, in what I call q square, the invariant mass of the final state. And again, at high energy, I can neglect the mass of the neurons, but that's not relevant in this discussion. Uh, often, I also Cross-sections are given in terms of a dimensionless, dimensionless uh, ratio, which is Q squared divided by the atomic center of mass energy. So the statement, uh, the statement of the pattern model is written already in this, in, in this picture. So I can separate, factorize the non perturbative dynamics of the protons in green here from something which I drew in, uh, I, I drew in red, which is going to be perturbed. And only depends on uh, 
degrees of freedom. Partially with degrees of freedom. So it reads magically. So in the parton model, we're going to write the cross section from proton proton to mu plus mu, mu minus, which will be a function. If I fully integrate over all final state apart from the minus mass of the mu, mu plus and mu minus, then the cross section can only depend on this q square and on the dimensional ratio tau. And the part of the model says that this cross section can be estimated as follows. One, I have the cross section in red, which is a partonic cross section, so I indicate it with a hat. And this cross section is a cross section for the scattering of two partons, in the particular case, a quark and an anti quark, to go into u plus and u minus. And the quark and the anti quark, the partons carry momenta p1 and p2, which are z capital P1, the two capital P2. And so if you do some dimensional analysis and or Lorentz invariance, the cross section can only depend on Q square. That's well, we choose to write the dimension full uh, dependence as Q square. And here, well, this can only depend on tau divided by Z1 over Z. Tau divided by the product of Z1 times Z2. You, you can you look at, you know, you can convince of this by looking at Lorentz. Okay, so this is the, the partonic cross section. What the part of it says is that we have to weight this partonic cross section by a function, uh, by functions f1 and f2, which tell us about the probability of finding, say, the quark in the first proton with the momentum fractions at one, and the anti quark in the second proton with momentum fraction z2. Okay, this is the generalization of the parton model. You know, was built by Feynman, your can for deep analysis scattering for PP coach. And so here you'll have a function f of finding the quark with fractions at one and the anti quark with fractions at two. And of course, because I'm fully inclusive, I, I have to integrate over the possible momentum fraction. Notice that I wrote like this is like almost equal to. You know, we would like to make some more precise statements of what, what are the things that we're missing while writing this factorization form. And we'll discuss this more in detail tomorrow. Um, but um, so at this, at this level, I just said this is like it's a good approximation. For instance, we see that you know I wrote an F for one proton, F for the other proton. So I have neglected all possible crosstalks between the protons. That's a very untrivial thing to say because you know you can imagine that as the proton comes close together, the field, the QCD field of one proton may interfere with the QCD of the other proton. And so the fact that we're able to write the cross section as the product of F1 of the two Fs is a rather untrivial thing. So that's the first thing to notice. Uh, the second thing to notice is that. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the argument of the partonic cross section sigma hat is dictated by dimensional analysis and uh, Lorentz invariance, boost invariance. Finally, um, we write uh, the partial model for cross section, not for amplitudes. Okay, so it's a statement about probability. And so again, we depart from the street. Uh, uh, and then beautiful theory of the S matrix that we want to, and we work with S with matrix element square, right? Process. Um, we're not going to say much, maybe later a few words about these apps, but these apps are uh, what are known as parton distribution function. Or P. Apps. And they um, embody, um, they contain the non perturbative information uh, of the proton dynamics. Not you know, in general proton dynamics, but the proton dynamics which is in the high energy collision. The feature, um, one of the consequences of this factorization formula is that these, these distributions are uh, uh, universal. 
meaning that although they cannot be determined in preservation theory, so for us, they are really uh, black boxes, they are, once you establish the factorization theorem, these, F, uh, these PDFs do not depend on the specific process we are looking at. So for instance, you can imagine that the same F enters deep in elastic scattering cross-sections, enter the dry line cross-section, enter the Higgs cross-section, and so on and so forth. And so the strategy from a phenomenology point of view is that we use processes that we know very well so that we can determine PDFs. And then um, once we have the PDFs, we can reuse them to compute cross-section that we didn't know. The crucial element about the, the pattern model is that sigma hat can be computed in perturbation theory. And again, at this point, this is the model. So I state this. We'll try to justify this later uh, tomorrow. So if I can compute in perturbation theory, um, then great. I can try and, and, and draw some, well, I can look at the, uh, the Lagrangian of the standard model and, and, and try to work out how can I produce new plus, new minus uh, pair in the final step. And depending on your personal taste, you can you know, look at the Lagrangian and try to understand the interaction, you can look at the list of the, the final rules, whatever, I mean, these, these, two, these two things are absolutely equivalent. Um, and you can see if, that if we assume that patterns are, and uh, you know, we can uh, exchange the word patterns for the quarks, uh, you'll see that, well, you know, let, let's start from the final, final state. You know, you know you have a mu plus, mu minus. How do you produce a mu plus, mu minus pair in the standard model? Well, the mu plus and the mu minus, they're leptons, so they're not strongly interacting. So they must be produced by, say, for instance, a um, they can be produced by a, an electroweak boson that decays. So for instance, you can imagine that you have your photon, you have a photon, and now I'm drawing final diagrams. Or you can have a Z boson. It must be a neutral current, right? Because the, these guys are uh, a part of the back. So it can't be a, a W. And, and then you see that here, what you need, again, is a particle and a particle pair to produce. That's the Z and that's the gamma. I'm going to label momentum, P1, P2, P1, P2. And you can try and, and look at the standard model final rules and see if there are other diamonds that you can build. Uh, um, the, the answer I, I'm afraid is going to be oh, these are the two. Notice that the final states are identical, and so we need to sum these two diagrams before square. Okay, we take we work with cross sections from the point of view of the initial states. We're not going to interfere with different initial state, but if you have the same final state, then you need to sum all. Of all possible final state and be forced quantum mechanic interference still holds. And so the amplitude, the, we're going to say the three level amplitude for this process is the sum of two amplitudes. One where you exchange where well, the intermediate state is a photon, and another one where the intermediate state is a z boson. They're not, they don't, they're not on shell in general. These are off shell particles, uh, of course. The, the, the two distinct parts. Okay, and then this is an exercise that you see that this exercise has nothing to do with PCD. There's no PCD coupling at this point. Or if you want to be fancy, you can say this is the order alpha is to the zero contribution to the cross section, where alpha is the strong. Okay, um, I don't know like, what, that, what your expertise is in uh, computing Feynman diagrams. Uh, these are, this is an excellent exercise. And uh, this is one type of exercise that I'm not going to. I don't have time to do in full details, um, it, but it's something that I really, really encourage you to do. Um, the, especially the, so you, what you have to do, you have to compute the, the two amplitudes and then square them, which means you have to compute the square amplitudes for the photon exchange, the square amplitude for the Z, and then interference. 
Now, the photon is a relatively simple calculation. Things get a little bit more messy uh, for the Z. And um, so let's, uh, well, so for instance, what I recommend you to do, well, let's, let's try them and then uh, we can talk. So for instance, M gamma, well, if you look at, if you remember or look at your um, uh, final rules, just pick final rules from one, one textbook so you don't mix up notation. Um, you see you have two electromagnetic couplings for the, uh, for the gamma exchange. And uh, one of them is rescaled by the quark electric charge in Q. And then you have your standard rules about spinners. Gamma mu, DP4, that's the final line. And you have the photon propagator. You should have the well, plus I epsilon, but these are three level diagrams, so the I epsilon prescription is not important. P bar, P2, gamma nu, U, P1. MZ, well, that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, well, I don't know if you remember. So here you have, you have the weak coupling. I, also, I need to look this up because I'm, I don't do electric calculation very often, so I never remember the prefactor. And you see the spinner algebra is the same, u bar p3, gamma mu, but then you have a, a non-trivial ba minus bn, right? Gamma minus gamma five, p4, and G menu plus Q. Now you have the fork Q minus A Q by Okay, uh, now you see that like squaring the, the second term of taking interference, there's a little bit of algebra to do. Um, it's not terrible if you work in the high energy limits so where you can neglect all the masses. But still, it's a few pages of, uh, of, of, of algebra, which I encourage you to do, um, and then maybe check it with the uh, uh, automatic, uh, automatic, automated um, tools like fine track. Uh, but if not, then it's a good exercise to do. So just to clear, we want to compute this guy, which will be the sum of this guy plus this guy plus twice or uh, the real part, but there's no really much real part in this. For instance, like in order to simplify things, you can, oh, Q, of course, sorry. Q is P1 plus P2, which in this case is also P3 plus P4. Um, there are tricks you can use to simplify the regulation. For instance, even though the, uh, uh, the, the weak part of interaction is, is a non abelian gauge theory, uh, at this level, the water length is essentially worse. So the Q mu, uh, the Q mu, Q mu, uh, contribution uh, gives actually uh, is vanishing in uh, if you use uh, the, the Dirac equation. Okay, so I'm not going to do this exercise. I'll, I'll leave you uh, to you if you want to do it. This is one of the not on, it's not one of the required exercises. It's, it's a bit lengthy, but if you want to do, um, that's very uh, uh, it's it's a, it's a very it's, it's a very good exercise. Okay, so once you have matrix element square, I, I just uh, remind you, or I tell you if you've never seen it, how do you build cross section? Well, cross section have a flux factor, and then have phase space. Well, the phase space, the Lorentz invariant phase space for two particles. Well, for each particles, you need 
a integration of the three momenta. And in my notation, this is divided by two pi cubed, two e three. And then you have the one for the anti -mima. And then you have the matrix seven square and a nominal delta function that ensures momentum conservation. Okay. Now we want to, if you want to compute the inclusive cross section, but for sure you can always you have to integrate the fully differential. For sure, you can you can you can integrate over either p3 or p4 use the, the delta function conservation. Four, e3. I write here e4, but really e4 is already constrained by the uh, the three moment of that function. And you have still one left. Why e4 is constrained? Because p4 is constrained and uh, uh, particle four leaves on the marshal. So if you fix the three momenta, also its energy will fix. Now, now we can't do this, these integrals quite freely because we need to worry what is the dependence uh, of what is the dependence of uh, the matrix element upon the variable we would like to integrate over. And so one way of asking, one way of, okay, th there's no a, an ambiguous answer because you, know, you can parameterize the kinematics in many, as many ways as you want, but what should be uh, clear to you when you try to do this type of calculation is what are the degrees of freedom? So how many independent variables we actually have in uh, the matrix element square? Well, counting the degrees of freedom, Is always a good exercise, so we'll do it. So we have um, two particles in the final state, so we have two four momenta in the final state, but we also have um, two Marshall conditions. So eight minus two six, that's why uh, here we have six integration. We already imposed the Marshall condition. Um, and then we have momentum conservation. So in the end, we have eight minus two is six, minus four is two, which are usually, well, sometimes parameterized as angles. For instance, the scattering angle and the azimuthal angle of five. Doesn't have to be, but you can pick whatever you want. Uh, let's say we pick these two, the scattering, an scattering, an scattering angle and azimuthal angle in the central mass frame, then D3, P3 can be written as P3, P3, D cos theta, D5. Which means that we can use the delta function to integrate with T3 and we leave the integration of the cos theta and phi uh, undone because the matrix element does depend on this. So we cannot do them free. We have to actually compute things. Okay, so if we do so, what we write? Well, okay, I mean, this is a particular simple case because the all particles are massless. And so we always have the, the full momentum is equal to the energy. So that's particularly simple. Because this tells, tells us that um, <coughs> E1 plus E2 is equal to uh, E3 plus E4, so is equal to 2 E3. And in particular, all the n E1 equal to 2 
square root of s over 2. S and. Okay, so um, with this in mind, we can write down the, uh, uh, we can do the, 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 the interval over, over the energy. And uh, uh, okay, so once you fix all the factors of pi's, we believe you get 64 pi square. It's uh, one over s hat minus one one equals theta. D phi. And then you have the matrix element square, which is a function only of phi and theta. Because E3 and E4 have been fixed. Okay, now I can't do much more, right, without compute, actually computing m squared, which I'm not going to do. So I'm going to write down the, uh, the final result. So what I find is that s hat, sigma hat, which is a function of s hat, can be written as, let me copy to get the, all the factors. The, I mean, the factors are not important, but let me get them right. Uh, And C, yeah, should have been more precise than that. M square, what I mean by the maximum M square, I mean that I sum over all possible polarization and final state uh, quantum numbers and I average over all possible initial state quantum numbers. That's why I get the one of N C uh, coefficient here. We'll get back to this tomorrow. Then I have a structure which is actually rather simple. So I have the um, square of the electric charge of the quark, that's the photon contribution. Then I have EL, EF, Kappa, S hat, O, S hat, Z square. And then I have Kappa, S hat, O, S hat. And this guy comes with the, the E L square plus E F plus sorry A L square E F square. And kappa is a it contains them. Its precise expression is not important, but contains the Fermi constant, the mass of the Z. So this is the cross section. Um, I told you that I was interested in d sigma hat over dq squared, but that's nothing else. That sigma hat, sigma hat. Okay, so let's go back to our master formula. D sigma at dq square at proton level is a function tau in q square. That was z1 integral over z2 f one f q bar z two d sigma hat d q square. Which I can also write. This is sigma hat. Function tau. And then I have the delta function, this delta function here. Now sigma hat is z1, z2, sigma minus q square.
Okay. So these sometimes useful to write in terms of Z1 and Z2, call them Z, so the product and the ratio. Let's call it W. And if I do so, what do I get? I get the integral, which is the integral in the omega over omega. That's the Jacobian that you get. FQ omega, FQ bar. So I write FQ and FQ bar. Clearly, we always have to symmetrize in the end because we don't know where the Q and the Q bar are coming from. Sigma hat tau divided by Z, Q squared. And then the delta function is Z has Z squared. Why did I write the things like that? You see, now I can do the integral over Z using the delta function. So this is one over S, hadronic S, S. And what this delta function, what this delta function tells me, it tells me that Z is equal to Q squared over capital S. But Q squared over capital S was tau. And so this tells me, tells me that sigma hat is evaluated at one in Q squared. All the energy, all the partonic energy goes into a disorder, goes into forming the plus and minus final state. And then I have to do, there's, there's one integral which I have to do, which is the one over this bit. The, the, no, z is equal to tau. So These are some, this integral over, over W is sometimes called the part on luminosity. Okay, so now I have a hadron level cross section. Well, the hadron level distribution. Can I plot it? As a function, Q squared. Well, you see that the, the PDF sort of like, the, you know, the, the smooth function. So, and in particular, in this case, in this approximation, they don't depend on Q squared. So they, uh, well, they depend on Q squared only through tau. If you imagine to work with fixed tau, there's no, there's no dependence. Really, the, the, the most of the Q squared smooth curve dependence is given by the matrix element square, which I wrote for you here. Remember that at this order, S hat is equal to Q squared. So you see, you have a one of the Q squared dependence, which comes from the photon contribution. Then you have a more complicated dependence from the interference because you have a pole in S hat equals M squared. And then you have a double pole in the Z contribution. Let me ignore for a moment the, the let's, let's, let's ignore for, for a second the interference, which doesn't add anything um, uh, qualitatively. But here you have essentially two contributions. You have a contribution given from the photon, which is a decreasing function of Q squared. And then you have instead a resonant contribution from the Z. And it's the sum of these two things and interference, which has like similar features. That needs to be invariant mass distribution. So you have typically some major spawning, and then in the presence of, we say, a resonance, you hit, actually, in this approximation, you hit a singularity. Because when Q squared is equal to MZ squared, the cross section blows up. So in the remaining part of this lecture, the last uh, uh, 15 minutes, what I would like to do is to uh, make sense of this divergence. So write, it, like, write this divergence in a way, well, address. Uh, write down a, 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 a formula which gives us uh, not a divergence by an answer. So we want to make sense of this behavior. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So 
the final part of today's lecture, I want to talk about. There is, a, there is a question. Okay, can you okay, give I, I can read it. Can you give a bit more intuition regarding how to think of the PDFs and why they are universal? Right, so this is a, a, an excellent question. Can I ask you, can I uh, say that we'll talk about tomorrow? Uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow. I'll, I'll try to convey a bit more of this uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, if, if you're not satisfied tomorrow, you can log in again. So, but at the moment, what I'm saying, what, what, what you can take up, and just take for today, is that essentially, you know, you write across the platonic, you have a hadronic cross section, you, you write the hadronic cross section as the cross section for part on A and part on B that carries fraction Z1 and Z2. And in order to part on A to take part into the interaction, I need to, if you want, extract part on A from the proton. What is the probability of finding a part with fraction Z1, with momentum fraction Z1 in the proton? This, this, this probability is given by F or Z1. So the, at this order in perturbation theory, the PDF gives me the probability of finding a parton in the proton, which carries a momentum fraction Z of the proton. But there's, there's a bit more to this. Uh, we'll talk about okay, I want to say a few words about the um, these these divergence at uh, Q squared equals uh, mz. And in order to do that, um, we're going to talk about the right right linear distribution. To make to keep things a little bit simple, we'll do we'll discuss a, a scalar theory, um, a scalar field theory, and then we we'll, uh, we'll argue that nothing changes when we when we talk about few, change, few things change when you talk about uh, gauge things. Um, so just a remind you that you know, when you, if you are in field theory and want to compute, uh, uh, one interesting thing to compute are correlators, cor uh, correlators, and in particular, the uh, two-point correlation function. That's the object that a leading order gives you the Feynman probability. Okay. Mm, now, okay, depending on like. Uh, so, what is the structure of this guy? Well, we'll have something like that minus max square. And then if I. Yes. So this is the renormalized two point match. What, it, what does it mean, renormalized? It means that in computing our lab, I found uh, divergences in the, in the loop, uh, loop corrections, and I was able to reabsorb these divergences by redefining the mass parameter of the theory and the uh, renormalization, but the, the constant, the renormalization constant relates to the field. So, what are these objects once I've done this, uh, this operation? Well, M is the mass. M now is no longer the parameter in the Lagrangian, but is the, the mass in some uh, renormalization scheme. And uh, I sigma. Is the all order one pi self energy? The pole of the propagator is located at p square equals m p square. Okay, this is the, the, the pole mass, the position of the pole of the position of the pole of the full two-point function. And so in this language, it would be m p square minus m square. Notice that m is not necessarily the mass in the pole scheme, right? So it could be different. 
compared, in general, it's different compared to like minus sigma and p squared. That this equation gives me, um, so this equation, which is the location of the pole, gives me, for instance, a relation between the mass uh, in the renormalization scheme that we chose, m, and the pole mass m. Now, fine, um, that's something that you've probably seen in QFT courses. Now, what is the interesting thing that we want to discuss now? If the particle, uh, uh, if the particle we are considering is not stable, that means it can decay into other particles, then we learn at the beginning of this lecture that through the optical theorem, we can relate the decay rate of this part, the total decay rate of this particle, to the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. And so in this language, we can say that the total decay rate of this um, particle, scalar particle we are considering, can be written as a flux factor times the imaginary part of the forward amplitude, but that the forward amplitude is precisely this guy here. Well, the imaginary part of this guy. And we can take the, uh, the expansion of this forward scattering amplitude into its one PI, one particle reducible component. And so on. Okay. Now, now I'm going to make an assumption. In a weakly coupled theory, like the one we are, we are we're going to be interested in, like QAD and QCD, at least in, in some regime, um, we can neglect uh, multiple 1PI contributions. And we can we can focus on this uh, this contribution. And if we do so, we see that the <coughs> total decay rate can be related to what well, is related to one of them p. Now the imaginary part of uh, the one pi contribution that is the imaginary part of sigma. This one. So in other words, the particle is not stable, so can be decayed to other particles if sigma develops an imaginary part. And if you if you do the exercise I suggest to you like. An hour ago, you'll see precisely this uh, arising. Now, this is precise. What is the bright Wigman scheme? Is a renormalization scheme in which the pole mass is defined only but the real part of sigma. So mp squared minus m squared plus the real part of sigma mp is equal to zero. And so the two-point function in this bright linear scheme as all the real parts the real part of sigma is absorbed in the definition of the, this pole mass. We should be called it the primary pole mass, but I mean, uh, the pole mass for gravity. And then I have plus i and p square, and then I have the, the, the imaginary part of sigma, which is related, can be related to the, um, the decay, the total decay. And I remind you this is true in a weekly couple theory, so when gamma. So, for instance, if we have a process in our scalar field theory, which is driven by an S channel diagram, in the bright Wigner scheme, this S channel diagram will be IG divided by IG square, sorry, divided by P square minus MP square plus. I M P gamma whole square. And so a bright linear close to the resonance, so close to the 
the region of phase space where P squared is, becomes um, very similar to um, P squared, the cross section is a nice. P square, and then F plus P square. And this gives rise to the you know, very famous probability distribution. You see that if I put gamma equal to zero, as I should do in perturbation theory, strict perturbation theory, then I do have the, the divergence of P square equals M P square. It's the same, very similar divergence to what we found in Kravian. The presence of gamma. So the fact that we include the two all orders, the one guy correction, um, um, shadows this this this, um, uh, this divergence, but gives rise to the very famous clear Breitbart peak. And gamma, the, the total decay rate, essentially represent the width of the distribution. And that's why very often in particle phenomenology, one often talks about decay rate or decay width. As, uh, as the same thing. That also tell, tells me that if I want to measure, measure the decay rate of a total decay rate of a particle, I can scan through its mass distribution, measure the width of the peak, and this gives me essential information. Okay, so that's bright Wigner. Uh, related to bright Wigner, uh, it's a uh, something which is usually referred to as the narrow width approximation. So what happens if gamma is, uh, is very small? So what happens in the limit? Gamma divided by mp equals to zero. Well, it's not difficult to show, and I'll let you do it as an exercise, that indeed, you know, imagine you have, uh, you have your, your Brian Digner, and you do you go into the limit where the width goes to zero, and that's you know, difficult to imagine. That this goes to a delta function, and if you want, we are back to the singularity we we started with. And one can show that this goes to a constant. But it's a delta function with a proportionality constant. So in the, in the narrow width approximation, I'm producing the intermediate state on its mass shell, p squared equals a p squared. And, and this production, um, and, and this delta function is accompanied by a prefactor which contains the total decay. How do we prove that this is the constant? Well, try to integrate both sides, and uh, well, try, try to integrate the bright linear uh, with respect to p square between minus infinity and infinity, and you'll find precisely this um, this constant. Okay, so going back to our uh, result, uh, we can exploit bright linear to uh, make sense of our partonic distribution. So I, I remind you. No, where was it? My partonic distribution. Here we go. This one. No, I, now I'm going to do something that you're going to hate. But if you if you're taking notes on an iPad, you can do the same thing. Now, what Bright Linear tells me is that I should modify the, these uh, these propagates. And in particular, this guy here gets replaced with kappa s hat minus mz divided by s hat minus mz square plus mz square gamma square. This is the total width. And then That's for the interference, and then the Oh, 
Okay, then I can repeat the same procedure as, as, as above. So I can look at the D sigma and DQ square distribution, and then I can build the Hadron level D sigma and DQ square distribution. And now I have my, if you remember, I have the photon, but now the, the bright Wigner, so photon contribution takes time, and then I have a peak on the bright Wigner. And the width of this is the term like a. So it gives, this gives me a, a clear resonance that I can. Uh, measure. Now, this gives me, indeed, if you measure these, you, you know, this distribution on the LC, you can find precisely this distribution. But this gives you also a clear strategy to look for particles that you don't know. You don't know whether they exist, just to do searches for new physics. <coughs> because a vanilla physics, new physics state will be something, for instance, that couples in the same, the couples like the Z boson does to be plus and minus. And so you can look at the environment mass distribution of mu plus and minus um, at large Q squared to see if you find another one of these bumps. And if you find a bump bigger, like very sharp or very shallow, or very broad, will depend on, 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 the, on the decay rate of these two particles, but you'll find evidence of new physics. There are many searches that go under the name of Z prime searches that do precisely this. They look at uh, in the environment mass of final state the immune pair and to see if you find another bump at the mass larger than uh, 91 GV of the samples. That you don't have to do with the with leptons in the final state. You can build the environment mass of two photons. That's actually the way the Higgs was discovered by looking at the environment mass spectrum of two photons. Um, there was a, a, a large background, but well, the background was, was falling distribution and they were able to see uh, at the beginning, a very small bump on this falling spectrum. That was the first hint in 2012 of the presence of the Higgs. By the way, you don't have to do it also with, with leptons or photons. You can also do it with QCD states. We'll see in a few lectures time that QCD gives, QCD gives radiation gives rise to objects called jets. You can build environment masses of different jets, plot it, and look for resonances in this environment spectrum. So this is a very, very general technique to look for new particles that we have seen actually in any, uh, in any collider situation. Okay, I think I, uh, I'm nearly done. The only, the very last thing I wanted you to say, and I apologize if I'm running two minutes late, is uh, what happens to our d sigma dq square distribution if we take the narrow width approximation? Okay, so let's imagine to do so. We have sigma hat, we, we work at the parson level, and, and we imagine to integrate the cross section in a, in a window um, about the Z mass. Of course, the narrow width approximation makes sense in the vicinity of the Z boson peak. If you look at the cross section at Q squared much larger, larger than Z squared, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so this can be written as the integral in dq squared sigma hat as a function as hat d sigma hat Okay. Um, so as I so as we said, like in the vicinity of the z pole. We can neglect the photon contribution and the interference. And so what we are left with is just the contribution from the Z. Let me write it in detail. Mz minus delta square, Mz plus delta square, dq square. Uh, what is this? This says four thirds, I don't remember by heart, of less over Z. C, and then there was the factor kappa squared, which was square root of two GF. Um, so you don't have to remember. This. I mean, this, is a, this was the definition of this factor kappa, which I need to write in full detail. Then I have S squared. Then I have the electroweak coupling. 
sorry for that. L plus A. Okay, and then I have the propagator, the bright linear propagator. But the bright linear propagator in the narrow width approximation, I can write it as pi over mz times gamma z delta of s hat minus mz squared. And then I have a delta function from before. So this is the narrow width approximation of bright linear. Okay, but now I can, I can exploit these to do the integral. Uh, to do, I can, use, I can do the Q squared integral using one of the delta function. And so if I do so, and I get all the factors correctly, which is rather non-trivial, you can check this. Okay, I do the integral of the Q square, one delta function is gone, I'm left with the other delta function. And you see that I, I, I'm able to separate things in two contributions, one in green, uh, one which I've written in green, and one in blue. What is the, the one in blue? Well, that's the cross section for QQ bar <coughs> to produce an on shell Z boson. You see that there's a delta of Q square minus MZ square. So this fixes the, the Z boson to be on shell. And what is the, the, the green part? I should have put it later, but anyway, sorry about that. Uh, that's the cross section for uh, the, that's the, decay, the, 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 the decay rate for the Z boson into a non shell Z boson into mu plus mu minus divided by the total decay width of the Z. So that is what is known as the branching ratio of the Z into a plus or minus. And you see that in the narrow width approximation, I can completely factorize the production process, QQ bar into an on-shell Z, times a decay process, on-shell Z into the plus or minus. Do I lose something? Of course I lose information, because this factorization is a product of my, approx of my narrow width approximation. But it could be a useful one, and a good one, if I'm working, at the, if I'm looking at the mass distribution very close to the Z peak. If I go away from the peak, then this distribution um, becomes less and less uh, appropriate. Okay, I think I uh, talked too much for today, but uh, essentially I managed to say everything I wanted. Um, so just to brief recap, um, so today what we discussed was essentially three things. In the first part, uh, we gave a very general introduction about colliding particles. And, and if I try to give you a feeling of like the kind of order of magnitude of things we have to deal with at the IHC, or more precisely, our experimental colleagues have to deal with the IHC. Then in the second part, I discussed a little bit, I, I stated the Parton model uh, for PP collisions, and I computed, uh, or at least sketched uh, the, the calculation for the Dredian cross section. And then I tried to make sense of this uh, divergence at the environment mass equal the mass of the intermediate particles by discussing the bright linear approximation, but the bright linear uh, formalism and the narrow width approximation. Okay, so that's it for today. If you have questions, I'll be around for the discussion this afternoon. And tomorrow, instead, we'll try to get to, to uh, go a little bit into a bit more details uh, about uh, QCD. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.